This is a conversation about embodiment and breath work with Prema Makiva. And it's a topic that's really close to our hearts as we've used breath work along with meditation and other practices on our Rebel Wisdom retreats. In this conversation, we talk about our shared interest in breath work, how it can access creativity, how it can process emotions, and also allow us to be more present. Our body is the vehicle through which we are meant to experience the world, experience relationships and relating, to experience the sense that, wow, I am part of everything that is here. And so when we are cut off from our bodies, we are essentially cut off from life. And so with breath work, as we're able to open up these areas of frozen energy in our bodies, these areas that became contracted as a survival mechanism, we start to experience more connection to ourselves, easier to relate to, less reactivity, more presence, greater access to our feelings and the feeling like I'm real, like I'm, I'm real, I'm here, I have the right to be here, I have the right to exist more access to our needs and more access to the actual love itself, love for ourselves and love for others. We also talk about how there's now a real growth in embodiment practices after decades of focus on the intellect and talking therapies. So if you look at the history of psychotherapy over the last 100 years, it's gone in waves. You know, we've had the um, psychoanalytic wave, the behavioral wave, the cognitive wave, you know, existentialism. Uh, there's been different waves through therapy. And finally, I would say finally, it's the evolution, natural evolution that we've now reached the body wave. And it's been a long time coming. I mean, this work, Reich was doing this work, you know, 80 years ago. So we're going to be running a five part course with Prema on breathwork, embodiment and character structures starting in January. It's going to be a five week journey. And each week we are going to start at the beginning of life. We're gonna start in utero and we're gonna journey through to about the first seven, six, seven years of life. And each week we're going to cover a certain segment of our early life development. And we're going to work with embodiment practices. We're gonna work with nervous system exercises and we're gonna work with biodynamic breath work and trauma release and inquiry practices to really dig into each stage of life so we can go into that unconscious material that our body is still holding, get in contact with that, and then give you exercises and experiences to help open that up in a safe environment. So we can start to release that chronic core contraction that is held around that early life experience. Check out the link in the show notes for more details and hope you enjoy this conversation. Hey, Prema. Hey, David. So we're going to talk about breath work. And I've known you for a few years. I've trained with you. And we've got a very similar background in terms of the, the kind of the counseling training and then the some of the breath work training, some of the embodiment training. And we'll talk a bit about that. And then we'll also talk about a course that we've got coming up that you're going to be running. Um, but maybe start from... Uh, if someone has never encountered breath work before, what, what is it about breath work that you find fascinating, that you find meaningful? Well, there's so much I could say about breath work, but I think what I personally really appreciate about this modality is that it takes us directly into the unknown within ourselves. So breath work has a way of opening up what is usually held unconscious inside of us feelings that we're not aware of, places in our body we're disconnected from or numbed out from that we're not aware of, and places of chronic tension and pain that we could very well be aware of that, but not aware of what's underneath that tension or pain or issue. And so breath work has a way of bypassing our defense structures, it has a way of bypassing the ways that we control, condition, hold ourselves, and takes us right into what is meaningful and that needs to be experienced in order for our mind and body to move to the next level of healing, the next step on the path, whatever we want to call it. It also has an incredible way of generating insight, uh, letting us get outside our normal mode of thinking, you know, get outside of our usual patterns of thinking, what it is that we already know, and can take us into areas of insight 
um, and understanding and knowing that we were not aware of previously. It's really a very interesting medicine in that way. And it can produce really unexpected and important results for people. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good summary. And in a moment, I'm going to ask as well, because I know that you've also got, uh, you've studied kind of the backstory, like the history of a lot of where this work comes from, the sort of the different therapeutic schools and where it split off from kind of psychoanalytic schools like Freud and, and Jung. So we'll go into that in a, in a minute, but I wanted to pick up on the thing you said about insight, because that's the thing for me, like I've, I've done a lot of breath work and had real emotional releases, but I also find it the most reliable way of tapping into insight, creativity. I'll do sort of the, the Wim Hof breath work in the morning, just as a kind of wake up espresso. And I'll often have like amazing insights, amazing um, creative thoughts during that. And it's sort of similar, I think, to, there's a lot of interest at the moment in psychedelic therapy and psychedelics as, as a tool for creativity. and for me, breath work is definitely in that sphere. Uh, Stan Groff famously invented holotropic breath work when they took the drugs away from him in the, in the 60s. Um, but yeah, there's this kind of interesting dynamic between, and there's no real accepted language for this because it's kind of almost a dialogue between um, with your higher self or with your higher creative potential or whatever it might be, sort of whatever, wherever that creativity comes from. For me, breath work is a real way that we can kind of interact with it and almost dialogue with it. Absolutely. I, mean, I really adhere to the IFS perspective, internal family systems perspective, that we are an amalgamation of parts. We have parts of ourselves that we're very aware of, that are functional in the world, that we like, that we tend to let out more. And then we have other parts of ourselves that we keep oftentimes um, in the shadows. And then we also have the unconscious aspects of ourselves uh, that we don't have so much access to. Like you said, that I don't know if the higher, higher awareness or higher power would really be considered unconscious, but it's definitely an aspect of ourselves that we don't usually have as much connection to as, or as easily can connect to. And breathwork has a way of bypassing, like I said, all those defense structures, all the ways that we patterned ourselves really is what it comes down to, in my opinion. Breathwork has a way of moving us outside of our patterns, and it gives us more access to all the parts of ourselves. And I completely agree with what you're saying about more access to creativity and higher power. We, we need to get outside of our structure in order to access that energy. And breathwork is a direct route right to it. Yeah, and there's also something about kind of healing the split between the mind and the body as well here. So, so many of the Kind of different schools of talk therapy for example don't really bring the body into into account and there's this sort of sense generally with work like John Viveki and the kind of embodiment perspectives that a lot of the people we've had on the channel talk about that we need to kind of reunite mind and body and embodiment being a, a huge thing as well and I know that you've because I've seen the presentation you've done that's really fascinating about the kind of history of where that split came from and maybe some of the more sort of renegade therapists or renegade thinkers who were working with that from the beginning, someone like Wilhelm Reich, for example. Could you tell a little bit of that, of that story? And do you think we're in a place where we're starting to see some of these more body-oriented ways of working coming back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating history. So we all know Freud and Freud's for psychoanalysis known as the talking cure, where he found that if people were allowed to free associate and talk and express uh, their feelings and their ideas, their images, their dreams, he thought that would bring about a cure of many of the ailments of the day that he was seeing, things that were called then neuroses. Um, and then Reich was one of his students. And what Reich was noticing is that people were talking and talking and talking, and they were going to analysis, you know, two, three, four, five times a week. And many people were not getting better. And he was very, he started to get influenced by some of the uh, more body oriented therapists of his day, but they weren't psychotherapists. They were dancers, uh, or people who worked with the body. Elsa Ginsberg was, Ginsler was one of them. And so he started to look at what needs to happen with the body 
in order for the psyche to release, in order for the emotions to be expressed. And he started to notice that people were holding, people held themselves in certain ways. There was a form that he called character structure that started to come into his thinking, where he was looking at what is being held in the body. And so then he started to experiment with well, what happens if we don't just talk, but if we work with breath, if we work with the body, what then gets to come about? And so that he was really the grandfather of what we call, you know, body oriented psychotherapy. And then one of his main students, of course, was Alexander Lowen, who went on to form bioenergetics. And Alexander Lowen was the one who really more systematized Reich's work in many ways. Reich is a fantastic writer, very prolific. Um, but Alexander Lowen was able to take this huge body of work and make it more digestible, we want to say, more, more accessible for people. Um, so Lowen, and then he also worked with Paracas, John Paracas for a while, who did core energetics. And then from there, there's, so they're like kind of the first generation after Reich. And then from there, you started to see the second generation come around where other systems started to take in this character structure model, which is really looking at how is our early history embodied? And in such a way, how is our early history held in our body, not in a healthy embodied way, but how is it held in such a way that it keeps us stuck in certain patterns of being? How is it embodied in such a way that it keeps us um, not able to fully access our life force energy or not fully act, able to access our strength or our authentic will? Um, different ways or our, our ability to, um, to fully access our sexuality, our sexual energy or our heart energy. So they started looking at what are the ways that our early traumas our early developmental disruptions, our core developmental needs were not met in these first seven to 10 years of life. And then how is that held in the body still? What the environment did not provide, the personality will try and compensate for. And it compensates for that through the body. That's one of the mechanisms that it compensates. The personality formation and the body structure it tries to compensate for environmental failures. And so after bioenergetics, you have the, the next generation, things like Hakomi came up and used a lot of the character structures, um, Narm, Larry Heller's work, um, body dynamics. Um, and so it went down through the generations. And now you have things like somatic experiencing. You know, Peter Levine uh, says that frequently he stands on the shoulders of Wilhelm Reich. He recognizes the giants in the field and how the work has become more refined over the years, but it's, it's, it's now the next wave is really seeing how it's not just talking about the thoughts, it's not just accessing feelings, but there is a, a felt, a, having to get into the felt sense, the body-oriented experience, the meaningful experiences held in our body. Eugene Genlin talked about that, the felt sense and focusing, how that is essential then for actual change to come about. People say all the time, I understand why I do something or I get why it's occurring. I have tons of insight, but it doesn't change. It doesn't get better. And so that's where the body needs to get brought in to really help start to rewire uh, some of these patterns and open up new possibilities. And what does that look like? And what are the things that kind of show up in people's lives that breath work can work through? Mm, oh my gosh. What it, generally speaking, what it looks like or how it shows up is more freedom, more sense of being alive and more, more of a sense of I'm here. And not only am I, am I here on this planet, but I belong here. A greater sense of safety. We can't feel safe and that we belong if we're not in our bodies. Our body is the vehicle through which we are meant to experience the world, experience relationships and relating, to experience the sense that, wow, I am part of everything that is here. And so when we are cut off from our bodies, we are essentially cut off from life. And so with breath work, as we're able to open up these areas of frozen energy in our bodies, these areas that became contracted as a survival mechanism. We start to experience more connection to ourselves, easier to relate to, less reactivity, more presence, 
greater access to our feelings and the feeling like I'm real, like I'm, I'm real, I'm here, I have the right to be here, I have the right to exist, more access to our needs and more access to the actual love itself, love for ourselves and love for others. So we're gonna be doing a course together. You're gonna to be leading a course uh, based on breath work, based on the different kind of areas of the body and working through some of this kind of the different forms of stuckness that we have in those different forms. And I'm really excited that this is the second one that we'll have done. We did one with Jules Evans that was much more intellectual. It was about the ideas that help us make sense of the world. And this is the second course that we're working with, with someone on. We're working with you because I think that the body, rebel wisdom is really about synthesis. The idea is you can't just have the ideas. We've got to have the practices as well, the relational practices, the meditation practices. And this very much for, for me, breath work is one of the keys for unlocking places that other forms of uh, intervention don't really unlock. So I'm really excited with this. It's something I feel really passionate about. And I know that you feel really passionate about it, and you've also got a huge amount of experience and, um, and background in terms of the, the, the framing of, of the work. So what do you wanna just introduce, like what's, what's the course gonna contain and what do you hope that people will get from it? Sure, yeah, I, I'm super excited about this group. It's going to be a five week journey. And each week we are going to start at the beginning of life. We're gonna start in utero and we're gonna journey through to about the first seven, six, seven years of life. And each week we're going to cover a certain segment of our early life development. And we're going to work with embodiment practices. We're gonna work with nervous system exercises and we're gonna work with biodynamic breath work and trauma release and inquiry practices to really dig into each stage of life. We're gonna look at what, did our, what were our environmental needs at that time? What did we actually experience? We're gonna look at that through both inquiry and through our body. We're gonna connect into what are the messages held in our body still left over from that period of time. And then we're gonna work with biodynamic breath work and trauma release to open up the segment of the body that is most impacted by our environmental failures that happened at that time. And so we'll be looking at the first stage will be in utero to about the first six months of life. Then we'll be covering about the first 18 months of life and then age one and a half to about three and then age two to four. And then we're gonna finish with age five, six, seven. So we're gonna be covering all those different stages, taking a really, deep look, not just intellectually, there will be intellectual material. I'll be talking about the stage. I'll be describing it, but it's more about, I'm going to be guiding us back into a journey to that period of time. So we can go into that unconscious material that our body is still holding, get in contact with that, and then give you exercises and experiences to help open that up in a safe environment. So we can start to release that chronic core contraction that is held around that early life experience and what do you hope that people will get from the whole experience mm -hmm. well many things um the top things that i hope people get a greater not just under a greater understanding of themselves certainly but like i said earlier i don't want just insight i want change so a greater understanding of themselves um, a greater compassion for themselves to understand more about why they have some of the patterns they had in life, and then the tools to actually change those patterns. So some of it will be released during the group. There will be different exercises that people will be able to actually release that frozen energy that's at our core, that frozen energy that is bound in our bodies. Yes. And then you'll also be given exercises and tools to keep working with some of those patterns. So we do need the insight and awareness to come out of these patterns, to come out of these compensations, to come out of the ways that our personality has been structured, to, like I said, to try and make up for what was not safe or what was not met in our environment. And so in short, people will come out with more awareness, greater understanding, much more self-compassion, self-love, and the ability to connect to themselves more authentically and to connect to others 
and then a release of the chronic core tension patterns held and more nervous system regulation. And that's key because in order to heal the trauma that we, are, that we store in our bodies, we need that nervous system regulation. We need to have more access to more of ourselves and that serves us as a platform for healing that we need to all do. And there's a kind of movement at the moment towards embodiment. You've got things like The Body Keeps the Score um, by Bessel van der Kolk, um, a lot of interest in the work of people like Gabor Maté and others who are talking about embodiment. And what do you think is behind that and where do you think it's going? Mm, that is a great question. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a natural evolution. So if you look at the history of psychotherapy over the last 100 years, it's gone in waves. You know, we've had the um, psychoanalytic wave, the behavioral wave, the cognitive wave, you know, existentialism. Uh, there's been different waves through therapy. And finally, I would say finally, it's the evolution, natural evolution that we've now reached the body wave. And it's been a long time coming. I mean, this work, Reich was doing this work, you know, 80 years ago six, even possibly a little long. My math is not great, but somewhere around 80 years ago. Um, and it really started to gain, gain steam in the 70s, you know, with Esalen and Gestalt. And, and finally now more and more, it's being recognized that we of course need to include the body. Why it's taken this long is actually more the question I have. <laughs> Why has the focus been on what's on the neck up? And so Yes, we've, we've come through and finally we've landed here. I don't think this is the final wave of therapy. I think body oriented is the wave we're in right now. I think where we're heading to is, is psychedelic psychotherapy um, and then incorporating the body with psychedelic psychotherapy, I think is, is going to be what's really is gonna to need to happen. Finding ways to do psychedelic psychotherapy where it's again, not just about feelings and beliefs and images, but there's also that connection to the body. It could be in the integration afterwards. I'm not sure how that's gonna look, uh, but that's where I think we're going to. And we need to include the body because we can't just heal from the neck up. We are not a mind and a body. We are actually a mind body. Our very language presents a split, a split that's not there in actuality. The split is only there in our language. And you referenced that earlier with the Cartesian um, dichotomy there, but that's not the reality of what we are. Our nervous system runs from our brain through our entire body. Our body is constantly sending signals back up to our brain, telling us actually how we are. How we are is a body oriented experience. It's not a mind driven experience. Hmm. And what's your background in this work? Hmm. Sure. So originally, I mean, I was, wow, how long ago? Very long time ago, almost 30 years ago, I started off as a body worker. Um, and then I became an acupuncturist and herbalist. And I had a private practice in San Francisco for many years. Um, and then became very interested in trauma and the link with trauma and chronic illnesses, because I was specializing in treating autoimmune issues. And at that time, I did not know, this is back in the 90s, there wasn't a lot of research out yet explaining the link between early life trauma, developmental trauma, and the formation of chronic illnesses and syndromal conditions later on in life. So I became very interested in, in, in trauma healing. And I started to explore breath work. Um, most of it I did not like. And then I found the biodynamic breath work and trauma release system. And I loved it. I loved it. Because it wasn't so much about having transcendent experiences, which I, I very much enjoy my transcendent experiences, no problem. But I wanted something that for myself would lead to more embodiment. I think we're drawn to what we personally need. And I needed that. So I needed something that got me more connected to my body. And finally, I found it through BBTRS. And so I explored different breathwork modalities, but that's really where I landed. And then from there, I went on to be, uh, study somatic experiencing. I've been a somatic experiencing practitioner for many years now. Um, I've also studied Hakomi, IFS, um, and various other uh, modalities as well. 
and try to bring a blend of all of that material in uh, the holistic perspective from Chinese medicine, the nervous system orientation from the somatic experiencing, the knowledge of breath work and the body from BBTRS, and as well as a general sense of how we function in the world as human beings from Hakomi and IFS. My perspective, because I come from the perspective of working with the individual, I'm not a grand theorist of things, but what I I have a healthy dose of respect for how we survive and why did I get curious about why, why are we disembodied and disembodiment, cutting off from our body, numbing out from our feelings, not being aware of our needs, not being able to really sense who we are, what we want. That's very helpful response to trauma, to overwhelm, to pain, to being fractured in our early life environments. So there's a, there is a very good reason why we are disembodied. And then the pathway back to healing our fractured relationships, first the fractured relationship with ourselves, with our family, with our close ones, and then with the world at large, with our environment, all of it is we need to get back into our own bodies. And until we're embodied and can really feel what is happening and not just live from this place in the mind of, of hopes or thinking we'll be okay or being able to kind of disconnect from what's happening around us or as, a, as a survival mechanism, for real change to happen, we have to be in our bodies. Our bodies is what gives us our, our intuition, the body is what gives us our sense of what's right and what's wrong. Our body is what helps us connect to what is it that we really need? What do we really want? What is it that we really value? Our values are not just mind driven. They are a bodily response to the situation at hand. And when we are disconnected from that bodily response, all we can do is, is act out of the patterns that our mind has formed. And unfortunately, most of our patterns formed are from fairly healthy or unhealthy early life experiences. So we're just replicating what's happened in the past until we can get really connected to ourselves and our body. And then we can start creating a better and different future. Prema, always a pleasure to speak to you and looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, David. Love talking to you. I appreciate our time together.